You're listening to the Informal Bible Study, a casual and applicational look at the Scriptures. I'm John Stonge, and it's great to have you with us today. In just a few moments, we're going to be looking at various portions from Acts chapter 18, and we're going to be talking about the kind of woman I hope my daughters become and my sons marry. And I'm looking at this today, or I'm bringing our attention to this subject today in light of Mother's Day. So if you're a mom and you're listening to the podcast today, happy Mother's Day. I realize that our podcast is released on Monday, so Mother's Day was yesterday for most of you uh, here in the United States. But happy Mother's Day to those of you who are moms. And to those of you who have been born, happy Mother's Day to your mother. We all need to give God thanks for our moms. Now, uh, before we take a look at this portion of Scripture today, I just want to remind you of several quick things. First of all, we invite you, as always, to visit our website, which is desirejesus.com. And on our website, you'll find our blog, and you'll find our online Bible studies. We have our bookstore, and we have devotional resources. We have links to both of our podcasts, the Informal Bible Study, which you're listening to right now, and the Chapter a Day Audio Bible. And we also have a link where you can sign up to receive our weekly newsletter. We send our newsletter out every Tuesday, and our newsletter is just a quick word of encouragement. We have a brief devotional in it. We also have some links to whatever is new on the website. So you could find that all at desirejesus.com. Dot com. And while you're on the website, we always love to hear from listeners, so be sure to send us a quick message, let us know you're out there, and please let us know if there's a way that we can be praying for you. Now, as I mentioned just a few moments ago, today we're looking at Acts chapter 18, and we're going to be jumping around a little bit in this chapter. But as we look at Acts chapter 18, we're going to be seeing a name show up multiple times in this chapter, and that's the name Priscilla. Priscilla was someone that the Lord used during the era of the early church to minister to quite a few people. And she's brought up here in Acts chapter 18. And so in light of it being Mother's Day, in light of the fact that we're celebrating godly women, we want to take a look at how the Lord used the life of Priscilla and some lessons that we can learn from that as well. So we're in Acts chapter 18. I'm going to start us off at verse 1, and I'll read down to verse 4, then I'm going to jump to verse 18, then I'm going to jump to verse 24. So this is what it says in the passage. After this, Paul left Athens and went to Corinth, and he found a Jew named Aquila, a native of Pontus, recently come from Italy with his wife Priscilla, because Claudius had commanded all the Jews to leave Rome. And he went to see them, and because he was of the same trade, he stayed with them and worked, for they were tent makers by trade. And he reasoned in the synagogue every Sabbath and tried to persuade Jews and Greeks. Now let's jump down to verse 18 where it says, After this, Paul stayed many days longer, and then took leave of the brothers and set sail for Syria, and with him Priscilla and Aquila. At Centria, He had cut his hair, for he was under a vow. And then we'll jump to verse 24 down to verse 26, and it says this. Now a Jew named Apollos, a native of Alexandria, came to Ephesus. He was an eloquent man, competent in the Scriptures. He had been instructed in the way of the Lord, and being fervent in spirit, he spoke and taught accurately the things concerning Jesus, though he knew only the baptism of John. He began to speak boldly in the synagogue, but when Priscilla and Aquila heard him, they took him aside and explained to him the way of God more accurately. Let's pray. Lord, we thank you for your word, and we thank you for the privilege that it is to be able to look at it together today. And Lord, as we look at this portion of Scripture from Acts chapter 18, we see these various references to Priscilla in this passage. We pray, Lord, that we would give you praise for how you work in the life of someone who submits themselves to you. We see that Priscilla did that. We see that you did wonderful things in and through her. And Lord, we recognize that there are many things that we could learn from the example of her life. So, Lord, as we walk with you, we pray that we would also profit from godly examples like Priscilla, and we thank you, Lord, for the moments that we have together today to take a look at what you reveal about her life in Acts chapter 18. 
We love you, Lord, and we thank you for all of these things. In Jesus' name, amen. When you become a parent, a curious change takes place in your life. You begin thinking about yourself less, and a large percentage of your time and emotional energy is invested in the care and well-being of your kids. It's a healthy but difficult process to endure because along the way you also go from being their hero who can fix everything and can do no wrong to being the target of a decent amount of complaints and critiques. Now somewhere along the way, however, I'm told that your kids start liking you again and my understanding is that that's primarily when they start having kids. So I guess that's something I have to look forward to someday. But I regularly tell my children that I'm praying for them. And there really isn't a single day of their lives that I haven't prayed for them, not because I'm being forced to do that, but because the Lord compels my heart to do so. The Lord compels my heart to pray for them. The Lord has blessed my wife and me with two daughters and two sons, and we frequently pray about their spiritual growth, their physical safety, and their future marriages. Along the way, we do our best to impart biblical wisdom to them in the hopes that they will receive it and adopt it as their own. And when I look at Scripture, I see many examples of people who trusted in Christ and used their lives to serve and worship Him. Many of those examples are godly women that we would all do well to learn from. And one such example is a woman who was part of the early church and partnered along with her husband with the Apostle Paul in his church planting ministry. And her name was Priscilla. And when I look at what Scripture tells us about her, I see the kind of woman that I would like my daughters to copy and my sons to marry. So let's take a look at some of the interesting things that Acts chapter 18 reveals to us about the life and the character and the faith of a godly woman like Priscilla. And one of the things that we're shown here is that she shows hospitality for the sake of the gospel. Look at verses 1 through 4 of Acts chapter 18. It says this, After this, Paul left Athens and went to Corinth, and he found a Jew named Aquila, a native of Pontus, recently come from Italy with his wife Priscilla, because Claudius had commanded all the Jews to leave Rome, and he went to see them. And because he was of the same trade, he stayed with them and worked, for they were tent makers by trade. And he reasoned in the synagogue every Sabbath and tried to persuade Jews and Greeks. Now, if you were going to plant a church, where do you think you would go to do that? Years ago, I knew a man who said he was called to pastoral ministry, and when he was asked about where he believed he was being called to serve, his answer stressed that he only felt led to go where his pay would be high and his life would be cushy. Now, he didn't use the word cushy. Uh, that's my description of what he said, but that's what he wanted, high pay, cushy lifestyle. And when I look at what Scripture tells us about the Apostle Paul's ministry, I see a very different mindset from that. If you wanted to experience a challenging context in which to do ministry, Corinth was the type of city that would give it to you. It was a city that was known for its rampant immorality and idolatry. Uh, it was a place where many people grew wealthy through trade, and it was also a city filled with prostitution. Now, at the time, to be called a Corinthian was often meant as an indicator that you were an immoral person. And that's where Paul chose to spend a year and a half preaching and teaching the gospel. And the scripture tells us that while he was there, he met a married couple, and their names were Aquila and Priscilla. And just like Paul, they supported themselves by making and selling tents, so they partnered together in this labor. And Aquila and Priscilla were also believers in Jesus Christ, and they offered Paul the privilege to stay with them for a time. This, by the way, was an important way that believers of that era would help traveling speakers when they would visit a community to come and proclaim the gospel. They'd give them a place to stay, and they'd give them some food to eat. It reminds me of what we're told in 1 Peter 4, 9, where it says, Show hospitality to one another without grumbling. 
That's something that we as believers are called to do. That's to be a pattern by which our lives are lived out. Now, showing hospitality is not always an easy thing to do. It's something that can be tolerable for a short period of time, but can grow increasingly more difficult when it stretches on for a longer season. And I'm sure that it was a challenge at times to graciously host Paul for a year and a half, but for the sake of the gospel, Priscilla allowed this to take place in her home. As a woman who loved Jesus and wanted to contribute to the efforts to make Christ known to others, she showed hospitality for the sake of the gospel. Now, this chapter tells us something else that we would all do well to notice, but I think it's something that godly women in particular would benefit from the example of. And in verses 3 through 4 of Acts chapter 18, it shows us that she wasn't afraid to work with her hands. Let me reread those verses. They say this, And because he was of the same trade, he stayed with them and worked, for they were tent makers by trade. And he reasoned in the synagogue every Sabbath and tried to persuade Jews and Greeks. When I was growing up, I was amazed at my grandmother. Her name was Ruby Huffman, and I was amazed in particular by her hands, because early on I noticed that it didn't seem to bother her to run her hands under water that seemed way too hot to touch. I was fascinated that that didn't seem to disturb her to do that. She didn't have a dishwasher, so I guess her hands grew used to the water temperature after washing dishes for her family for so many years. She also worked in a boot factory in Wilkes-Barre, Pennsylvania, helping to sew and manufacture boots and shoes for quite some time. My grandmother's hands were strong, and I was surprised when I also realized that she had no discernible fingerprints. Imagine that. Her, her fingertips were just smooth. You couldn't see a fingerprint or feel a fingerprint there. And the work that she did over the course of her life, it basically seemed to wear her fingerprints off. Now, I'm glad she didn't use that advantage to pursue a life of crime, <laughs> but she didn't have fingerprints. And when I look at a portion of Scripture like this, I wonder what Priscilla's hands looked like. Were her hands strong? Were they calloused? Did she have discernible fingerprints, or did she not? Could you figure out how she made a living just by looking at her hands? I point that out because this scripture tells us that Priscilla worked with Aquila and with Paul making tents. It doesn't just indicate that Aquila was a tent maker. We're told that as a couple, they made tents together. This is useful to notice because it's clear that Priscilla didn't flutter around like she was a princess. She wasn't afraid to work with her hands. It wasn't beneath her dignity to engage in manual labor. And I believe she displayed a mindset that godly women of every era should notice. Families benefit from this kind of mindset, and so does a local church. Priscilla was a true partner who was fully invested in the ministry entrusted to her, and she wasn't timid about working with her hands. Something else that this scripture tells us is that she was willing to go where the Lord directed her. Look at verse 18. It says this, After this, Paul stayed many days longer and then took leave of the brothers and set sail for Syria, and with him Priscilla and Aquila. At Centria he had cut his hair, for he was under a vow. When I was in high school and college, I could sense that the Lord was calling me to serve in pastoral ministry, but I had some objections to that calling that took me a few years to work through before I agreed to do it. And one of my big objections was the idea of moving. From what I had seen, pastors seemed to move a lot, and that did not appeal to me. I moved frequently when I was growing up, and I didn't want to repeat that pattern as an adult. Since becoming a pastor, I'm grateful that my family has not moved frequently, and it actually occurred to me this week that this month marks 10 years that I've been preaching at our church here in Langhorne, Pennsylvania. 10 years, that went by very quickly. But when you look through what Scripture tells us about the Apostle Paul and his ministry, we see that Paul's ministry involved a considerable amount of traveling. 
As the Holy Spirit directed him, he traveled to different cities throughout Europe and Asia, and he would preach the good news of salvation through faith in Jesus Christ. And as Priscilla and Aquila partnered together with Paul in ministry, this portion of Scripture also displays a willingness on their part to go where the Lord was directing them to go. There are patterns that exist in the ways that men and women perceive life that tend to be rather consistent. And as I share this, I'm not trying to be stereotypical, but I will say that there are patterns that I've noticed. So maybe you'll agree with what I'm about to say. Maybe you'll disagree. But hear me out for just a second. In my counseling ministry, one of the things that I have learned about women is that most often they express an appreciation for safety and security. It's a pattern that I've seen in many conversations through premarital counseling or through counseling at different stages of life. Safety and security are things that women tend to appreciate. Moving to a new area is something that I have heard many women express concern over because it can challenge their feelings of safety and security. But at the same time, I've also observed godly women express a willingness to do so when the Lord made it clear to them that this was his calling on their lives. And as the Lord made his will clear to Priscilla, we can see from this passage that she was willing to go where he directed her. This actually reminds me of the words of Christ from Acts chapter 1, verse 8, where he says, But you will receive power when the Holy Spirit has come upon you, and you will be my witnesses in Jerusalem and in all Judea and Samaria and to the end of the earth. And what was Priscilla willing to do? Well, she was willing to be a witness of Christ wherever he directed her to go. Something else that we could see about her when we look at Acts chapter 18, particularly when we go down to verse 24 and the verses immediately following it, is that she joyfully partnered together with her husband. Let me reread those verses. They say this. Now a Jew named Apollos, a native of Alexandria, came to Ephesus. He was an eloquent man, competent in the scriptures. He had been instructed in the way of the Lord and being fervent in spirit. He spoke and taught accurately the things concerning Jesus, though he knew only the baptism of John. He began to speak boldly in the synagogue, but when Priscilla and Aquila heard him, they took him aside and explained to him the way of God more accurately. One of my greatest joys about our church family is the presence of the various ministry teams that serve together to do ministry. And likewise, it's a joy when we can see multiple examples of this mindset occurring at home as well within the homes of the families of our church. When husbands and wives partner together as a team, instead of operating in a continual state of independence, great things are accomplished for Christ's glory. After Aquila and Priscilla left Corinth, we find out from Acts chapter 18 that they settled in the city of Ephesus. And while they were there, they sought fellowship with other believers, and they had the privilege to hear a man named Apollos speak about Jesus. Apollos was apparently a gifted, impressive, and eloquent speaker. And while he taught about Jesus and expounded the scriptures accurately, there were still a few things he needed further instruction in. The impression we're given is that Apollos may have been delivering a a similar message of repentance that John the Baptist had preached, and Aquila and Priscilla likely took the time to connect more of the dots for Apollos by helping him come to a deeper understanding of the significance of the life, death, and resurrection of Jesus. Please notice yet again, that this scripture provides another great example of Priscilla's desire to partner with her husband. They worked together, they traveled together, they worshiped together, and they discipled together. Without a doubt, there was a high degree of love, trust, and respect present in their marriage relationship. She joyfully partnered together with her husband. And one last thing that we can see from this portion of Scripture is this. She looked for opportunities to invest her wisdom in teachable people. 
Again, let me reread verses 24 through 26. It says this, Now a Jew named Apollos, a native of Alexandria, came to Ephesus. He was an eloquent man, competent in the Scriptures. He had been instructed in the way of the Lord, and being fervent in spirit, he spoke and taught accurately the things concerning Jesus, though he knew only the baptism of John. He began to speak boldly in the synagogue, but when Priscilla and Aquila heard him, they took him aside and explained to him the way of God more accurately. So again, one of the last things I want to point out about Priscilla is her willingness to invest the wisdom the Lord gave her in teachable people. Growing up, my other grandmother, Ruth Stonge, was one of the wisest women I knew. And her father used to invest his wisdom in her, and she absorbed it all. And then she tried to invest it in me and the rest of her grandchildren. The way I see things, and many of the decisions I make as an adult, can be tied directly back to the wisdom that my grandmother invested in me, particularly during turbulent seasons of my childhood and adolescence. She always had a word of wisdom that helped me out. And I suspect that the Lord used Priscilla in a similar manner for many people during the era of the early church. She was able to invest her wisdom into Apollos because he was teachable and receptive. Her counsel bore fruit. As Apollos continued to preach, he was able to give others a more clear and a more accurate portrayal of who Christ was, what Christ did, and what Christ continues to do, because Priscilla took the time to share with him the wisdom the Lord had blessed her with. A godly woman takes the time to invest wisdom into the lives of others for Christ's glory. All that to say, I realize that my daughters are quickly transitioning into their adult life right in front of our faces, and I want them to glean from Priscilla's example because I believe it's also the pattern that they've had the privilege to observe in their mother, my wife, as well. And I know that the day will soon come when my sons will choose someone to marry. So I regularly pray that the Lord directs them to women like Priscilla because she was intentional about blessing her husband, about blessing others, and living a life of faith that brought Christ glory. If I'm blessed one day with daughters-in-law like that, I'll be quite grateful. And when you look at this portion of Scripture, we can see an example of godliness that the Lord displayed through the life of Priscilla. She showed hospitality for the sake of the gospel. She wasn't afraid to work with her hands. She was willing to go where the Lord directed her. She joyfully partnered together with her husband. And she looked for opportunities to invest her wisdom in teachable people for Christ's glory and for the sake of the spread of his gospel. We thank the Lord for an example like this that we have the privilege to glean from today. Let's pray. Lord Jesus, we're so grateful for all that you have done on our behalf. We're grateful for the fact that you lived the perfect life, that you died to atone for our sin, that you rose from the grave, and that you share new life with all who trust in you. Lord, we're grateful that Priscilla trusted in you and that she was willing to pour out her life in service to you as she blessed those around her. Lord, you used her to help others gain a greater glimpse of who you are, and we're grateful for that. And so, Lord, we pray for all women that they would glean from this kind of example and that they would submit their lives to you, that you could work through them just like you did through Priscilla. Likewise, Lord, we pray for men that they would learn to value this kind of woman, that the mindset and the heart and the faith that's present in a woman like Priscilla would be something that they would learn to appreciate. And that as we consider marriage and as we pray about those that our children or our grandchildren will one day marry, we pray, Lord, that, that our grandsons and our sons would marry women like Priscilla and that you would be glorified in their households as a result. Thank you, Lord, for your word. Thank you for the privilege to be able to look at it today. Thank you for the women in this world who glorify your name. Thank you for our mothers and our grandmothers. And thank you, Lord, for who you are and for how you operate in our day-to-day -day lives. We commit ourselves to you today, and we pray this all in Jesus' name. Amen. 
Thanks again for listening to the Informal Bible Study. As I mentioned at the start of the episode, we invite you to stop by our website, desirejesus.com, and check out all the different resources that we have there. If you're not on our email list, be sure to sign up for that so that you could get the brief word of encouragement that we send out every Tuesday. And we'll also let you know if there's anything new on the website that we want to point your attention to. But that's it for us today. We hope you have a wonderful day and a wonderful week. And we look forward to catching up with you again right here next Monday. Take care.